cooking. They were really cooking, man. Welcome. My name is Gary Dial to my apartment in New York City. And uh, if any of you have known Charlie, you know that was usually his opening line to your lessons through all the many years, whether it was in person or was it, whether it was through correspondence lessons. Um, <clears throat> I'm from Montclair, New Jersey, where I grew up. And I went to high school in Newark, New Jersey, to a place called St. Benedict's Prep, which I'm still involved with. And I was very lucky during those very young years to have met the queen of jazz, Mary Lou Williams. And Mary Lou took me under her wing for a couple years. And um, after Mary Lou, I moved to Boston and took a summer program at Berkeley. And then when I returned from the summer program, I met Charlie Benakis uh, in my first year at Berkeley. Charlie wasn't sp uh, teaching at Berkeley at that time, but uh, that's when I met him and started to take lessons with him. It was an incredible experience because I knew, as I've said before, that I met my teacher for life. Uh, Charlie had an incredible methodical approach to music, which is what I felt I needed at the time. And um, it was a building block approach, and um, it was so, so helpful for me at that time. Now, during that year in person with Charlie, we covered um, his famous Autumn Leaves exercises. We did giant steps and uh, a host of other voicing techniques for about a year. Um, and I was also uh, gigging in Boston at the time with uh, some of his peers, uh, which was uh, Johnny Rapucci and Jerry Baganzi and Joe Hunt and some of my uh, teacher heroes of that era. Um, after one year, um, I moved to Bermuda via a gig by the great pianist Kenny Warner and became the house pianist at the Princess Hotel. So to continue my lessons with Charlie at that time, Charlie had these correspondence courses, which were 10 lessons, and he just basically sent you the lessons. And um, there were uh, written notes, and then there was cassettes of Charlie speaking uh, about the lesson itself. So in those three years in Bermuda, while gigging, I would practice those correspondence courses pretty uh, intensely. And they were in jazz improvisation, they were in polyrhythms, they were in ear training, they were in the blues, and they were in solo piano playing. And uh, believe me, just those five courses took me uh, all those years, and there were only 10 lessons. But the polyrhythm course, I basically got through two lessons, and then it became going like this for me at the time. So after three years, I was ready to come back to New York City and um, <clears throat> start gigging, and I called Charlie, and I needed now more. But he was no longer doing those correspondence courses. He was doing one lesson at a time through the mail. And I said, great. So I started up my lessons with Charlie, and did not stop for 37 years, and did these lessons from weekly or every two weeks, or if I had gone on the road, sometimes it would be a month. But I stayed pretty consistent for all those years, and uh, it was just great to always hear, Hey, Garrett, I like that line, man. Now, after Charlie passed, I actually went back and listened to his voice saying that to me every week, and I realized like that it was the exact same pitch every single week, which uh, is a whole other issue. So I studied um, through the mail with Charlie correspondence lessons in so many different topics, because you could imagine doing all those years. But I started with what he called double mambos. And double mambos were basically two triads. And they call, some people call them triad pairs. Some people call them hexatonics. And I worked uh, through those courses with him. And that was probably be about 20 lessons. And then I worked on <coughs> composition studies, which were um, compositions based off a particular kind of voicing technique. And then I worked on, um, I mean, so many, so many different things, a more linear approach, chord over chord studies, um, rhythmic studies. So um, there was a kind of a little bit of a joke that um, towards, right towards before Charlie passed, I was uh, doing a course of his called Guitar Harps, and I had done 18 lessons in this one course. And you're always at the, after doing 18 lessons, you feel like, when is this gonna be over? When am I, when am I gonna get something new? Well, Charlie passed, and when I saw the great Vic Juris's uh, 
lessons that he had done with Charlie, he had taken the same course, but he had done 156 lessons in the one uh, course. So I was kind of like, whew, thanks Charlie. But um, through the many years, we had a lot of great fun and great uh, joy just hearing his voice. And um, there was a few things that you just used to um, be so amazing about his knowledge and his quick reference to it. One was I was uh, studying through him, uh, Sophia Rosoff, the great classical teacher. And we were discussing something through her book. Um, it was called the Abbey Whiteside School. And it was um, something about touch and everything. And I said, Charlie, you know, I just don't get it. This book is a little heavy for me. And I, I reread it and I just don't understand it. And he said, the reason why you don't get it, man, is because you haven't studied the criticism of it. Now, you need to go to the Juilliard Bookstore and get the April 13th edition of the 1978 Piano Quarterly uh, criticism of it, and then you'll understand it. And I went, okay. So he had such a photographic uh, memory to help you no matter what it was. Um, another fun story was <laughs> I was doing a uh, performance and a master class in Salzburg, and I was also into, at the time, uh, meditation and self-hypnosis. And I was giving a class in self-hypnosis to relax at the keyboard and all that. And when I came out of this state, I realized that my finger wouldn't work. And I was panicked by it. So that evening, I couldn't play the gig. And so I wrote to Terry Roach, who was actually on the road in, uh, I think, Nashville. I said, this crazy thing happened to me today. I can't function my finger will not function and she said well, what happened I said I don't know if I banged my finger but I was coming out of a hypnosis and uh, I, I couldn't move it and so she, she said well that crazy thing happened to me is that while at the same time it was happening to you a bee came and stung me in the finger and my fingers all puffed up so I said whoa wait a minute I think you should keep your vibes away from me so when I came back to New York, people were saying I should go and have a pin put in my finger, and it was actually very serious. It was called mallet finger, which is a sever your finger right there. So I went through therapy, um, and I had a, a splint on my finger for four months, so when I came out of it, it was straight up, and I couldn't move it. I had to go through uh, therapy, and I remember Jerry Baganzi asked me to do a gig, and my finger was still like that, and I said, Jerry, I don't think you want me, but he was kind enough to put me on the gig. So I've decided I'd better call up Charlie and actually drive up to Boston for the half hour I would get to see him and ask him what I should do. It's because I was very concerned about it. And of course all the friends in New York were, what are you going to do from Charlie with Charlie after you've done all this material with him? What are you going to, what's he, what's he going to give you? And I said, I'll let you know when I get back. So I drove up there and I said, Charlie, see this finger? It's like that. But now this hand, I can't do that anymore. And he looked at me and he said, I don't know anybody that plays piano like this. <laughs> I don't understand your question. <laughs> and I was like, that was worth the five hour drive, Charlie. Thank you very much. So what he gave me was a C major scale to practice. So I drove home, it was five hours to Boston, and all my friends called me and said, what did Charlie give you? What did Charlie give you? Like sharp 23 chords and all this? I said, no, he gave me a C major scale. And they said, get out of here, you're not telling me, you won't tell me what he gave. I said, no, this is the actual truth, this is what he gave me, it was a C major scale. Well, actually, that C major scale was very, very helpful to me. And so there was many great stories like that with Charlie. One of the very last ones was is that when he had just gone online, and he was new to computers, and we all were, and he was sending the lessons back online rather than the cassettes, I was in New Jersey, and... Uh, I said, okay, I have my lesson ready for Charlie. I'm going to send it to him online. And, um, but then I'm going to go outside and put a piece of chicken on the barbecue. So I sent him the lesson through email. I went out, put the chicken on the grill, flipped it over, and I came back inside, and I heard, bing! I got an email. And there was an email from Charlie with my new lesson all done. I hadn't even finished the piece of chicken. So I went, wow, this guy is like a fast order cook with these lessons, they, they were moving so quickly. I said, oh my gosh, this is gonna be great, but now I don't have to wait two weeks for the cassettes. So we had many, many fun laughs through the years, and um, it was always in good humor, 
and yet it was always so uh, valuable to me. Um, when I came back to New York, <coughs> um, after about 10 years of being on the road with various jazz groups, I joined the faculty of the New School and the Manhattan School of Music and wrote the curriculums for jazz improv <coughs> in both schools and theory. And I have to say that my studies with Charlie were so um, influential to these curriculums, and I know that they've benefited uh, generations of students that came through this because of the beautiful way that he laid it out, and I want to thank him. So then when Charlie passed, um, I really didn't know his family at all, Margaret and Barbara and the rest of the clan, and they asked me via Charlie to help continue the lessons of Charlie Benakis online. So I went up to their home and met them, and all of a sudden we were immediate family. We became very, very close family members at this point, and very close friends. And he had a room in his house that they called the Bat Cave. And this is where he did all his correspondence lessons, and there was two double steel doors that you would go in. And there was a not the greatest piano in the world, um, and a TV set on it, and a filing cabinet, and there was the, the books of all his work and all the um, notes about his students that he kept through all the years. So it was my job and Barbara Bonacus' job to go through all this material and kind of get a way to present it once Charlie had passed. So I'm so grateful and it's such an honor to be the a person helping the family continue his work. So I want to thank them, and uh, it's been a beautiful joy to me. Um, so when I teach, I'd like to teach sometimes the um, three elements of music, and the three elements of music are melody, rhythm, and harmony. So Charlie, we used to um, break down those three elements. Now I'm going to just show you a few little teaser elements to bring you guys on board, but one of the first elements about melody was something I learned from Charlie which has actually become very famous and it was called his autumn leaves exercises. Now what they did was is that when you have a progression of chords that go through a song, if you isolate one tone at a time through each chord, you can get beautiful melodies and you're actually improvising with a direction. So for example, if I play the third of each chord through the progression, and I really can do that, and then I can voice lead through uh, those thirds, I'm gonna be able to get a compositional sense to my line. It could be the fifths, it could be the ninths, it could be the elevenths. So I'm just gonna show you a, the simple technique that I learned from him when I was 18 years old, that I've taught ever since, and I still use, even on complex music. through the first eight bars of the song. So if I start on C minor seven and play E flat, that's the third, then to A on F seven, D on B flat major seven, G on E flat major seventh, C on A minor seven flat five, F sharp on D seven flat nine flat thirteen, and B flat on G minor major seventh. That's kind of pretty just in itself. But now I'm going to give myself an assignment and I'm going to say I'm going to play even eighth notes very slowly and I'm going to make the third of each chord land on beat one of every measure and I'm going to try to voice lead up to that third and then with, with the added uh, challenge I'm going to try to voice lead the last note of the measure into the third of the next chord. It could almost sound a little classical. So, here we go.
Now, if I put it into a more of a jazz context and have a little more swing rhythm, it could sound more something like this. of the chords. Natural 11, sharp 11, sharp 11, sharp 11, natural 11, sharp 11, natural 11. so very, very valuable because uh, not only can you use it um, on a song like Autumn Leaves, but you can use it on very complex music as well. The, the technique works on everything because you are truly improvising, but you are actually voice leading through one idea. So, we, so again, we take one interval and we can isolate the interval and then we slowly, can we play eighth notes or triplets and get to the next third on each downbeat, and then we try to then improvise around it. Okay. So now I'd like to speak about some rhythmic concepts that I did with Charlie. And with uh, most of all the rhythmic concepts that I did with Charlie, <laughs> um, they still had to do with like actually notes uh, on scales and things like that. And these are called subtractive rhythms, or heniolas, okay? And so we would take <coughs> um, many different versions, I'm gonna give you just a couple, okay? So what we start with is we're gonna take eighth notes, okay? And we're gonna make diatonic triads up the uh, C scale. So here's uh, diatonic triads. <laughs> Because they're three note groupings, they're gonna, people are gonna play them as triplets. But that's not what we did. We played these three note groupings as eighth notes, okay? Now it's very uh, important for Charlie, uh, when he spoke, to be able to count while you're practicing an exercise. He didn't really believe in metronomes because he did not want you to play like this and be very rigid like a metronome. Now there's very, a lot of people have different opinions of that. Um, I think a metronome is valid for certain situations. So for example, if you can't play with a metronome, you're in trouble in the studio world because everyone's using click tracks and all that. But as far as relying on a metronome to practice all the time, he felt that you really need to get your own inner pulse, okay? So we do a counting exercise playing that, uh, those same triads grouped in eighth notes, but I'm gonna count quarter notes right through it, okay? So now we have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now, if I subtract the root of each triad and take out the root of the C triad and the, the, let's say the, the D of the D minor triad and put a rest there and continue to count, then I'm going to have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Now let's say I take the third 
of each triad out. It would sound like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay? So then we did things like, well, we'll take seventh chords, four note chords, But instead of grouping them in four, which is what a seventh chord is, we put them into triplet rhythms. Okay? So now we would have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. If I take the root of that seventh chord out, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. And so on. So we did so many different lessons, and this is just a little, uh, you know, to demonstration on the, on the exercise. But if I put it into a rhythm over a bass line, you can start to hear what these little hemiolas sound like. So if I play a <clears throat> progression line. say playing groupings of five, well then, and you're working on how to put it over four four, well when you come to a five four rhythm, then you're going to be all set. So that was a, uh, a great uh, technique that I learned from him, it helped me very much in my phrasing. Uh, now the next thing I would like to discuss, so so far we've discussed melody, which is the autumn leaves technique of isolating tones, and then the next technique that we discussed was <coughs> the rhythmic subtractions creating hemiolas. Now the next thing I want to talk about was, is the harmony. Now Charlie was a master of chord voicings. And through all the years I had worked on many different styles of chord voicings with them from what they call four-way close, to upper structure triads, to voicings in fourths, to drop two voicings, all these different voicings. But another uh, thing that really helped me was his technique of what we call inner voices. The inner voices is when you have uh, your, a melody tone and you have uh, voices moving inside the uh, harmony, okay? So I'm gonna demonstrate one or two versions of that. And here we go. So I'm gonna discuss this basically on a two, five, one in the key of C. So on a D minor seven chord, I have the root, the 13th, the 11th, the 9th, the 7th, Is, is that that's on beat one. On beat two, okay, the ninth here 
is going to move up to the third, and the thirteenth here is going to move down to the fifth, but we're going to make sure that we're holding the eleventh. So you can still hear that. Simple, but very beautiful. Now when it goes to the G7, the dominant, we're going to take sharp 11, 9, 7, sharp 11, and root. Sharp 11 is going to come up to the 5th. The one on the left hand is going to go down to the 4th. Okay? And then finally resolve to the 3rd. So we have... And now we go to the 1 chord, C major 7th. So we're going to have... The nine on top, the major seventh, the third, the sixth, and the root. And then we interchange the two parts in the middle. Okay? Very simple again, but beautiful. So now the whole two five would be. So now, of course, you have to do that in the key. to isolate each chord, not just always do it on the 2 5 one. So if I have just minor 7th chords, okay. let's say I do the dominance. Okay. Or the major 7th. because he, I was just taking, again, major seventh chords and going down whole, whole tone scales. So Charlie would give it as a 2-5-1, but then there's many ways to isolate those into all minors, all dominants, all majors. This can be very beautiful. Now, that would have been one lesson. And again, I did hundreds of lessons like that uh, with Charlie. Now, one last little technique that I'd like to show is a left hand technique that we worked on. And that was <clears throat> what Charlie called left hand figurations or left hand figs. And they are um, very good for the left hand. And what they are is taking four way close chords, meaning close chords, and breaking them up in many different ways. I'm going to show you just two techniques that we studied together, which would have been like one lesson. But first, you'll take any voicing. So let's say we take C major 7th with the sharp 11 on top, the 3, the major 7th, I'm sorry, the root and the major 7th, okay? And then you're going to practice that through 12 keys. So that would be the one voicing through the keys. Now, the technique happens is that well, the first one we studied is you play the voicing, and when your left hand comes up and covers the voicing, you hold the top two notes of the voicing and then arpeggiate the bottom two notes of the voicing.
this counterpoint going in the left hand, but it was really just taking a voicing and then breaking it up. Believe it or not, there was about 150 ways to break up that one chord. So you had to have a lot of patience uh, to sit through these lessons and almost find them like as a hobby. I found out through my own career that sometimes my lessons with Charlie would immediately impact what I was working on. Um, in my composition studies at that particular time, I was doing uh, some CDs with my partner Dick Oates and we were writing for full orchestra and for strings and my, my lessons went right into that. Same thing when I did uh, my Brassworks record, you could just see the exact stuff that I was doing. Other times it might not relate to my exact uh, personal career at that time, but I didn't care because I couldn't wait to get my lesson because it was almost like a hobby at that time. So I would run down to the uh, mail room and be like, Charlie's lesson, I want Charlie's lesson. And I'd open it up and there'd be like two measures. And then it would be like, hey, Garrett, how you doing, man? I like that line. So just to finish up with this little video today, the rhythm exercises that I showed you, I took one or two of the lessons with Charlie. Now, he didn't want the lesson to go basically more than six minutes. So if I had to tell him some Irish story, because I'm a storyteller, he, I could tell he'd go, oh, come on, get on with the story. And I know he would go upstairs and tell Marvin, like, man, he went on for 40 minutes with this story about, like, his friend Gerard down in New York and like that. But so this rhythmic lesson, I thought, I am, this is so valuable for me because I felt I needed it so badly. I'm not going to, I'm going to take this one lesson and I'm going to do it in every meter, in 70, in 3-4, in this meter, in this meter. I'm going to put it on the blues. I'm going to do it on different chord changes. I'm going to do it on everything. And it took me a whole summer, and I'm thinking, he's probably thinking, well, what happened to Dial, right? Well, I took the whole summer and worked on the one lesson. It turned out to be 400 pages that I did. It was this big, and I was so proud of myself because I got a Federal Express box, and it was probably like 100 bucks at the time to send him my lesson back like a proud student to him. And he wrote back and says, man, I didn't tell you to do that. <laughs> I was like, you got to be kidding like that. So anyway, now we're going to move to the next lesson. So it was always a humorous exchange when you know, he gave you the most encouragement when he kind of felt you needed it, and then he wouldn't give you any when you were like a little puffed up. So that was a, a great great spiritual teacher for me, along with a great sense of humor. And um, I miss him dearly to this day, but I have to say that um, I feel so connected to him through Margaret and Barbara and Peter and Paul and the, the whole family, and I am uh, just showing my gratitude. So thank you very much.